Hi, Noshers. My name is Micah, the host of Not Your Bubby's Nosh, a conversation about your favorite and least favorite Jewish foods, your go-to source for holiday meal inspiration, and a place to discuss and kvetch about which Bubby made it best. Welcome, Noshers, to one of my solo episodes of Not Your Bubby's Nosh. We have had so many incredible guests on the show for season two, and I'm sorry, but you've got to deal with me for the next episode and me alone. So as you may or may not know, by this time, I hope you do know, I write recipes full-time for a living. And I take photos of them, I take videos, I write about food, and that's how I make my money. One thing that I have been working on this past year and I'm excited to have for next year is that I'm writing a cookbook. Now, a cookbook is a whole ordeal. People have all these ideas that they come around within a snap, within a couple months or even a single year. And that couldn't be far from the truth. So we're going to talk a little bit about the process and experience that I've had writing my first cookbook. This cookbook comes out in March. March 19th, 2024, set your calendars. It is called Nosh. And as someone who's speaking about Nosh all the time through Nosh with Micah, not your Bubby's Nosh, Nosh with me, one, two, three. Wait, one, two, three, Nosh with me. How did I get that wrong? That's not a surprise that that's what it's called. So it is Nosh Plant Forward Recipes Celebrating Modern Jewish Cuisine. I am so proud of it. It has 100 recipes in it, a whole ton of photos that I've taken myself. And this has been a lifelong goal to have a cookbook of my own, even though I've spent my career writing for brands, magazines, and newspapers. This is becoming a reality. So I am often asked, what is the process like? Is it a lot of work? How do you start? Are you going to make a ton of money? Uh, Yes is a no to some of those questions. So let's dive in. Of course, everyone's experience is different, but here's my own. Started about four years ago with an idea, a vegetarian Jewish cookbook. And there wasn't one that I really found to be of interest to me. There wasn't one that really spoke to me. And I've really felt even four plus years ago that the vegetarian vegan aspect of writing was overlooked. And so I started a Google Doc that listed recipe concepts and ideas and why I wanted to do it. It had stories in it. It must have had over 300 recipe concepts in there. It came with, along with a story, my thoughts about Jewish food, stories that brought me joy and really fueled my passion for Jewish cuisine and culture. In a way, even just writing this Google Doc was a huge way for me to connect with my heritage and family. And truthfully, I thought no one would ever see it. It's a pipe dream. And I'm pretty sure in my Google Drive, it was just called Grandmother's Kitchen or something. I think I actually started it shortly after my grandmother, Eva, passed, who was a huge inspiration in my life and career, especially when it came to food. So I would kind of pull it up here and there, work on it and play around. And as if I had a quiet week at work, I would go in there more and especially during covid I would definitely go in there more. So during COVID, my husband and I self-published a children's book, One, Two, Three, Nosh With Me. And it was then shared with a Twin Cities native, Angela Engel of Collective Book Studio, who thought it would be a good addition to her company's bookshelf. So within the Collective Book Studio, we were chatting with her about getting it republished more formally throughout her publishing company. And while I had her on the phone, because you don't ask, don't get... I proposed my Jewish vegetarian cookbook that I'd been dreaming of. And traditionally, you pitch to a literary agent who then pitches to publishers and help negotiate deals. And they're kind of like the middle person who does this. They take a cut of your advance or a portion of what you make, but they are really the people who can help polish up these proposals and whatnot because my proposal wasn't polished by any means. It was really just the idea. And I was hoping that somebody would take a chance on it. So I spoke with Angela and she's so lovely. She's from the Twin Cities area and really passionate about bringing new writers, Jewish writers, and female writers, especially first-time writers, to the forefront. And so after we agreed to work on both projects together, both the kids' book and the cookbook, contracts happened, meeting the team happened, met my editor and what the schedule would look like. So this was 
to late summer 2020. Ooh, two, 2022, I think. And this was after she probably got the book late spring 2022 to the kids book to see if she would want to publish it. And I was really pushing for a spring 2024 release. And that was because I wanted it to be um, on trend where I was seeing all these vegan vegetarian cookbooks coming out for cultural cuisines and also pre-Passover, which is such a huge holiday for food, obviously. Um, and people often look to recipe books and people are thinking of like, well, what happens if I'm vegetarian during Passover? What can I eat? What do I do? And I really wanted that date. Some books take more than two years, many more than two years from contract to bookshelf. And I see a trend in the Jewish book space where you're either out for the high holidays or for Passover. So I really wanted to capitalize capitalize on the Passover season. And it's also my favorite season for Jewish food. I think it's the best. So after that, after all the T's were crossed, I's were dotted, the first task was I created categories of recipes. So I decided I wanted starters. I wanted baked goods. I wanted cocktails. I wanted essentials. And then I made a list of recipes. And I pulled on the ones that I'd had in that Google Doc for years prior. I thought about new ones and I came up with a hundred, more or less. This was a huge challenge and this was all done before testing. So some recipes just didn't make the cut or they didn't work out. Um, Some of times I realized that the recipes were there because I liked them, but probably no one would ever make them. And I tried to make it as reader friendly as possible. So people would want to make these recipes, not just once more than once, maybe every week. And that was a really hard part of it because I had so many ideas in my mind. And then when it came to testing, I was like, oh my goodness, this is garbage. This is terrible. Or I had some recipes that I was like, is this safe? Is it boring? But as I tested and people gave feedback, it ended up being their favorite recipes. And something I learned was this book is for the reader. It's not just for me. Sure, this is a huge part of my life goals and career, but this book more than anything needs to be reader-friendly, something that you want to use, that you relate to, and something also that you want to make the food from. And this is for people to make. If I just wanted to make my own stuff, I wouldn't need a recipe book. So I really learned that during this process that it wasn't as, it's so, the book is so personal, but it's also meant to be used by you the reader. And that means that instead of super fluffy stories of her each recipe, I also wanted to be sure that I included tips and tricks and notes and substitutions so that you or the reader would be the most successful. And there's less room for error, error, let's say, in the recipes. So during this process, I met with my editor um, weekly, actually, which I know is really rare. And I was able to ask her questions about writing and styling and all of these things. Um, And I was writing and testing and retesting and researching for months. And there's so much that goes into a recipe book. It's not just a recipe, but the recipe should be tested multiple times. And there's also the little head note or kind of paragraph at the top. There's testing for the time that it takes. There's thinking about wording and flow of each recipe. There's the notes, the variations, the substitutions, the little the, those little pieces of wisdom that you want to include as well to give some context and historical context to some of the recipes, especially in Jewish food. Because this is not an Ashkenazi Jewish book. It's not a Sephardic Jewish book. It really touches on a lot of parts of the diaspora because Jewish food is so far-reaching. And it's also important when we're doing these cookbooks to give credit where credit is due for recipes like falafel. What did it start as? Was it fava beans? Was it chickpeas? What was the first falafel in Egypt like? Or what are preserved lemons and what cultures do we use those in? And even things like apple cake that really kind of became popular in Pennsylvania, and, and I wanted to be able to include those historical facts in there as well, because I think it's important to give the credit and also to show the breadth of Jewish food out there and the fact that when Jewish people are expelled and persecuted and have to move from point A to point B to Z, they take their food customs, make new food customs according to where they are, 
and also become a part of different cultures. And I think that's such a beautiful thing about Jewish food. So that's basically on the recipes. Um, And that takes so much time. I had an amazing group of about 65 testers and they would test the recipes. I'd get feedback and then I would retest them, get someone else to test them. And it was back and forth and back and forth. And sometimes I tested a recipe 20 times before it even hit a tester's uh, tester's kitchen. And then I would test it again and again, because food's also personal. And some things that people prefer are different. And I find it so interesting to see how 10 people can make the same recipe and they will always turn out different. So that's the writing of the recipes itself, which really is maybe 60% of the book, but there's so much more. And something I find really important in cookbooks is the photos, which makes sense. Um, If I don't see a photo for something, I'm there's no chance I'm going to make it. I want to see a photo for every recipe. And I know that people are visual learners, especially today, especially now that I make a chunk of my income as a food photographer. So many people hire a food photographer that comes out either from the advance or out of the pocket of the author. So when you see a beautiful food photo spread, that's because the author chose that. And I think that's really important to know. And When you're on a limited budget, like myself, and seeing as how I do take photos for food as a part of my day job, I chose to do this on my own, which added a layer of control, yes, which I love a control, but also a layer of, I guess, challenges on top because every time I tested a recipe, I shot it as if it was going to be in the book. Um, But that means that I had extra time, extra mess, extra everything to deal with every single time I shot a recipe and tested one. This helps me make a lot of dishes, a very big mess, but I also had this huge arsenal of photos that I could choose from. Um, So myself and the designer could choose from these photos and make the book and have a lot of options, which is rare because often you'll book like a three, four, five day shoot, depending on how many shots you need. And those are the days that you can do it. But I got so much footage and photos that it was really cool to have this huge folder of photos at the end of it that I can also use for like marketing and stuff like that. And as I was testing and taking my photos, my recipe list changed a lot. My ideas changed a lot. Some new ones were born. Some were total fails. Um, My vegan matzo balls took me over 15 tries. I cried so much. I went through so much matzo meal. Um, just think of how bad my stomach felt after trying 15 plus different versions of vegan matzo balls. And then I also had non-vegan matzo balls. It took me about 10 tests to get a hamantashen dough that I loved. Um, and then I changed the flavor (laughs) and made a different kind. They started as classic, I think, if I remember correctly, just classic hamantashen, but vegan. And then I decided to make them into a funfetti with a cashew filling one. And then there were these vegan Passover rolls that I really wanted to do with almond flour. In my mind, I thought this was a fantastic idea. About eight tries later and probably $80 worth of almond flour later, I gave up because they were just little hockey pucks of sadness. I ate them, ate every single thing I tested and failed at. But wow, what was I thinking? So it took me some time to say no to those. But as I said no to others, I could say yes to some to other things. So one of my favorites that I added after that Passover roll fail was the complete opposite of a babka roll with halva, pistachio, and cardamom. And they're beautiful little rolls and and almost like they're made in muffin tins instead of a loaf. So I said, see you later, Passover buns or rolls, whatever. We are going full full flour with these babka rolls. And they're one of my favorite recipes in the book now. Took me a lot to try because at first it wasn't those flavorings. And as you test and test and test, just things evolve because you get, you're inspired, you get a new idea. You say, what if, and how can I make this interesting? And how can I make this different? Because if we all just put out the same concept of babka for every single cookbook, no one's going to try all of those. So you want to make sure that it's going to be unique, but also far reaching enough that people will actually make it. 
So I mentioned my testers. So after I tested, I had a group of my about 65. They provided feedback through a Google form for each recipe. Shout out to my friend, Deb, who taught me how to make a Google form for this. Okay, that's a stretch. She made the Google form. She did all of that. She's an angel. But you know what? It takes a village for these things for these things. Um, So then once I got the recipe back, I tweaked it, assigned it to another tester. And sometimes I would even just assign it to a select group of people who I knew would do it exactly to how it was written. So that included friends, family, and they would just get recipes from me to test. And they gave great feedback as well. I was asking my husband for feedback, but truth be told, every time I asked, he was like, oh, it's perfect. I love it. But that's not helpful. So (laughs) he was kiboshed from the experiment. No more. Um, And then after that also, I hosted a cookbook testing party with a food networking group that I'm a part of that features females and food in the Bay Area. And we all sat down to a delicious dinner and talked about it. And they give really fantastic feedback as well. And the thing is that you, there are professional recipe testers out there. And some people that did this are, but there's also home cooks. And I think it's so important to get home cooks to test your recipes because home cooks are the ones who are going to be making the recipes. People who might not have as much experience cooking, people don't have the um, professional background in cooking. It is so important that everyone who makes the recipes in the book is successful if you're a professional chef or it's your third time in the kitchen or your first. Maybe if it's your first, like call me first and I can help walk you through at least some of the skills. But I just want people to be successful and get the same results, but when they're making the recipes. And that's, of course, why I added my tips and tricks to each each one as well. So people wouldn't have to say, hey, can I use this oil instead of that oil? Or can I, how do I tell if my challah dough is proved? Or why is my challah dry? Or why is it so hard to shape my challah? I want that to go hand in hand with any recipe text that comes out. So there's so much thought that goes into this. And this is just up for the manuscript. My manuscript was due last March and I had about 200 pages of text. Not all of that would ever go in the cook, in the book itself. That would be a way too thick cookbook and cost anyone too much money that nobody should be paying that much for a cookbook. Um, and nobody would want to read that, honestly. It probably was culled down because it was a quality over quantity situation. Um, But then it's also time to think of what does recipe layout look like? How are the chapters formed? And what is the most reader friendly? There's, and again, like the amount of thought and care that goes into this process is pretty fantastic because it's not just thrown in haphazardly. It's well thought out. You want to think about the way that people are flipping through, organizing even main dishes based on what they contain and really being mindful about what it what it is. And my goal is for it to be friendly, modern, inventive, approachable, something you want to make on a Tuesday as much as you do on a Shab- for a Shabbat dinner. But even things like thinking about fonts, um, the negative space and layout, the color of things, having little icons to determine if they're egg-free, dairy-free, vegan, um, gluten-free, all of these things, how you want to word the time it takes to make something, whether it's, I, I, I say, on the table in. And then if there's any resting time, like rising time for bread, I indicate that there. But I don't want to say that something's going to take you 45 minutes if it's going to take you 60. I want to be reasonable. And I think that that's when I got the testers that was one of the biggest things I took from it was I'm a professional cook. I am fast. So when I, when I thought it would take 40 to 60 minutes and they say 60, I go with 60. I'd rather you be pleasantly surprised than hate me. Um, Because when you do things online, people will tell you if they're not happy with you. Yeah. I read all those messages, unfortunately. So after all of that layout happened and I got a couple of sample pages of the recipe and photos and something called a galley, which is basically like a bird's eye view of all the pages. It's basically a ebook in progress. And this had a ton of back and forth about asking questions and making changes. And that's what I liked about being with a smaller publisher is that they're so open 
to change. I have some friends doing the recipe and cookbook process and they don't get as much input, but with a smaller house, you definitely get more hands-on experiences. Um, But while that's all happening, we're also thinking about a cover design. I shot that cover so many times and the cover is just like a plethora of food. And so every time I shot it, I remade all of the food. It was exhausting, but I wanted to make sure that it looked unique. I didn't want it to emulate other books I was seeing. And I also wanted to show that it wasn't just like vegan versions of your favorite Jewish foods. I wanted to show that it was like a whole bounty and abundance of things that you want to nosh on. And even that going back and forth and back and forth to make changes, change the font, change the coloring, change the placement, and really get that modern and fresh look took a long time. Long, 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 long time. And all this is happening, of course, as I'm working full-time, don't forget. So this is not my full-time job. I took a few months off to really hone in on the recipes, but otherwise I was working alongside all of this. So alas, it's almost time. We go back and forth with an editor, an external editor, my own eyes, my husband's eyes, my mom's eyes, scouring the pages to make sure it reads well. It makes sense. It looks incredible. And once we can edit no more, I sent out my galleys to other authors to get little blurbs so that they could give um, their feedback, but also to use as marketing. And I called on all of my foodie friends to do this and even some random people that I'd never met, but are in this space and I wanted them to see it. And everyone was so kind and gave us beautiful blurbs that we could use for marketing um, in the Amazon listing and bookseller listing and, and more. And one thing that I did learn was that there's just so many decisions that go into writing. And now when I flip through cookbooks, I'm so much more appreciative of the time and care that it took. Um, even from like the texture on the cover, my the writing on mine is raised and a little glossy. And it's just like these little bits of detail that really count. On the inside pages, it's called the end papers. Um, I didn't want just a plain color or just it to be plain. So we've got this really cool graphic of illustrated Jewish foods and vegetables. And I wanted this to be just a really fun book, but also timeless, not so trendy and in the moment that it would be, I don't know, stale in a few years, but I want this to be something that you'll have on your bookshelf for a really long time. So throughout all of this, I'm working I'm testing, I'm doing all of these things. And I'm also working with a PR team to drum up excitement in traditional media, social media, and helping to plan events. So there's so many hands on this book. I can't even, there must've been at least 200 people who have helped make this happen. Um, And now we have, I don't know, four and a half, five months before it comes out. Pre-orders are now available on Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Books a Million. Um, I can send the link for pre-orders and every pre-order is so special. I want to talk about pre-orders actually. So that first week that your book comes out is so crucial. The amount of books that you sell in that week helps you get onto lists. It helps drum up excitement. It helps with sales moving forward. But the special thing about pre-orders is that it's the books that are sold within that first week, yes, but also all of the pre-orders. And when pre-orders happen, booksellers and stores can see that there's already excitement and interest for your book. So they're more likely to buy the book for their store. So without pre-orders, it's it's much harder to sell the book after the fact because it shows that it's wanted. And it's so helpful for an author to get those pre-orders. And I'll be having some prizes and freebies for people who do pre-order. And for anyone who has already, I am so insanely grateful for that. And don't forget, if you spend the money now, by the time it comes in March, you'll have a hundred percent forgotten. And it's basically free. It's basically like a gift you've given yourself for March. (laughs) And is that girl math? Maybe this is cookbook math. It's the thousands of dollars going into ingredients and testing and photography. But if you buy the cookbook early and then it gets delivered on the pub date, it's free. Cookbook math 101. 
<laughs> um, so if you can pre-order, it is so, so, so appreciated appreciated. And then once the book comes, the other biggest thing that a reader can do is review it. And of course, buy it for a friend. But reviews on Amazon, Goodreads, wherever you bought it is so helpful. Even if you didn't buy it on Amazon, you bought it in your favorite independent bookstore, which I always recommend. Reviewing it on Amazon makes the world of a difference because that's how people find things these days. We're not in that old school way of selling cookbooks where we Essentially, if you're on the French shelf of, of the bookstore, you get purchases. People are looking at reviews. And all in all, cookbooks are a huge time and financial investment. Despite what you may think after all that, it's not lucrative when it comes to a payout. I mean, some people make a huge living and a great living if they make it big. But for most of us, we do it out of passion, not out of payment. So anything that I get from this will be hopefully to recoup my own costs and create more opportunities for me in the future. Um, hopefully also pay for a diaper or two for my baby. <laughs> um, but you know what? I'll, I would not do it any differently because it's been such a rewarding experience and a huge life goal of mine. But books are not, unless you're, unless you're big time, unless you're big, big, big time. I don't know if it's the books that make you the money or if it's the media and events that come after it that do that. I get a lot of questions about like, so is it a lucrative business thing? Like, will you make a ton of money? And I just laugh and no, I don't. And then they get disappointed and ask why I do it. And then I have a hard think about my life, but oh well. So now that all of these pieces are done, it's time to start marketing. Um, so as I mentioned, pre-orders are huge. I've been busy, busy, busy planning events and thinking of partners to help promote them and networking. It's not a matter of if you build it, they will come. You have to go get them. You have to be on it. You have to be open to doing events. I hope to come to Twin Cities um, in 2024 to promote it and we can nosh together on some of the recipes. And let's talk about, about the book a little. So like I said, 100 recipes. Um, there are seven sections. Uh, that's of course after I talk about stuff like Jewish food glossary and becoming vegetarian and things to think about and blah, 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 and tips and tricks. Um, there's breakfast and brunch, uh, a soup section, which includes the matzo balls, vegan and non-vegan, salads, spreads, and sides main dishes, baking and desserts, cocktails and beverages, which is my favorite, and essentials. Some of the highlights in the book that I love are my Malabi porridge with rose, pomegranate, and pistachio. I've got a turmeric veggie soup with vegan matzo balls. Yum. A smashed cucumber dill salad that was inspired by my Zeta's pickles. I make that one every week. And then my halva pistachio babka rolls. And the cocktail I love is the date syrup and hawaj espresso martini. And mm -hmm. lastly a everything bagel chili crisp. All of this in a, I think, 256 page book with lots of photos. And the photos I think are really something to behold. I, I did 90% of them myself. I had to hire someone to take some photos of me because I can't do that. I don't know how to take pictures of people. And then I also worked with one external photographer and a, a day or two with another stylist to help do like some of the larger spreads when it comes to holiday menus. And of course, I have a holiday menu for each. And I think what's really important about this book is that it doesn't, you don't have to be vegetarian to like it. You don't have to be vegan. You don't have to want to become vegetarian. All you need to do is love food and you have to be open to trying new recipes and if you have anyone in your family who doesn't eat meat, wants to eat less meat or enjoys vegetables sometimes or has a dairy allergy or has lactose intolerance like most of us Ashkenazi Jews, this is the book for you. And you know that you're supporting someone who's so passionate about it as well. So I hope that you love the book as much as I do. I cannot wait for you to see it. If you've listened to this episode and you shoot me a DM, um, I will put you in the running for a copy, a pre-order copy, and I'll do this until March 19th. So if you DM me from whenever this comes out until then, I'll put you in the running for a copy. And if you pre-order it and share that with me as well, I will send you a little gift. So I've got these really beautiful um, US made bandanas of Jewish food. I will send you a little gift if you show me that you have pre-ordered. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you 
order both one, two, three, Nosh with me and Nosh, I'll send you something even better. And any support, whether you share my page, buy the book, do anything is so appreciated because especially in times like now, and now I'm, I'm recording this in October, 2023, but there has never been a more important time to show up as a proud Jew and putting myself out there and people who work in the Jewish space, putting ourselves out there every day as a Jewish person can feel really, really, really scary. But it is our job and our responsibility to carry on Jewish tradition, carry on Jewish joy and bring joy to the Jewish community. And I hope that this book brings you a little bit of joy, just as I hope Not Your Bubby's Nosh brings you joy as well. And of course, I'm always so grateful for the folks at TCG Folk for believing in me and believing in the Jewish community to put out fabulous content like they do. So that is the A to Z, probably giving you too many details about how my cookbook happened, the process of writing it. If you're not exhausted listening to this, wow, you should write your own cookbook because I'm exhausted just thinking about the process that it's been. But thank you so much for listening and join me next time on Not Your Bubby's Nosh. Not Your Bubby's Nosh is a part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network and is produced by Jew Folk Inc. For more shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. If you've got questions, email me at micah at noshwithmicah.com.